do please be seated. The 2006 film Click tells the story of Michael Newman, played by Adam Sandler, who's an architect bullied by his boss and often choosing work over his family. One day when out shopping for a universal remote control, he's handed a free remote control by a man named Morty with the warning that it can never be returned. Experimenting with the remote, Michael learns that it can be used to control life much like a television. He uses it to his own benefit at work and to fast forward past illnesses. However, soon the remote learns his preferences and starts skipping through time automatically. Well, Michael tries to rid himself of the remote, but it reappears each time and Morty refuses to take it back. Things quickly go from bad to worse, with all of life's negatives playing out in Michael's life at high speed until his death. Michael then finds himself waking up back in the same department store where he was first given the remote. Perhaps it was a dream after all, or perhaps he's been given a second chance. Well, there's a lot about being in control in today's passage of James's letter. Whether it's in the way we slander and judge one another, putting ourselves in God's position, or in planning every detail of our lives in an attempt to be in complete control, or the control over life and livelihoods that the extremely wealthy have over their workers. James speaks against the control we exert over others and over ourselves. Continuing from the previous passage, which warned of the dangers of straddling the fence, trying to keep one foot on the path of the world and the other on God's path, James goes on with his teaching on godly living. As we work our way through the verses of our passage this morning, we'll see what James teaches about godly living in our dealing with one another, in our planning, and in the dealings of the extremely wealthy. Firstly, we'll look at what James says about our dealings with one another. This is in verses 11 and 12. He says, Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbour? These verses come immediately after and are directly linked to the verses we considered last time when James spoke of our need to repent before God. Our repentance, like our faith, has practical outworkings visible in how we deal with other people. Speaking against another person is all too easy. We remember James's words about how the tongue is untamed and can run wild, causing great damage. Here in verse 11, James says that to speak against other people is to speak against the law. After all, the law calls us to love our neighbour as ourselves and not to judge them or trample over them to fulfil our own desires. When we do these things, it's like we're saying that God's law doesn't apply to our treatment of this person in this situation, even that we know better than God. We sit in judgment of the law, deciding if, when and how it comes into effect for us. But we cannot slander God's law without slandering God. As James says, there is only one lawgiver and judge. So putting ourselves above God's laws in our treatment of other people is also to put ourselves above God. We forget who God is and who we are. We place ourselves in a precarious position at risk of rejecting God and appointing ourselves in his place. So how we treat others reflects our view of who God is. We need to remember that he alone, as lawgiver and judge, has the right to show us how to live and behave with others. <clears throat> 
that he is the one who will judge justly, who can save or destroy, not us. Our behaviour towards others is to be determined by him and his law. How often we forget the truth, the simple truth, that we are not God. And when we do, we're unable to appreciate the more wonderful truth that we're ruled by and saved by God, the God who loves us and calls us his own. Secondly, let's look at what James says about our planning. This is in verses 13 to 17. He says, now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we'll go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. James is talking to travelling merchants, but the words of verse 13 are the familiar language of everyday planning. Whatever our circumstances, we all plan, we all think ahead. Busy lifestyles mean that we have multiple commitments, and many of us would not be able to function without a diary or calendar. I know I certainly wouldn't. Yet in all this busyness and planning, there is a danger that we adopt an ungodly, even arrogant attitude. Planning our lives as if we were in control. Assuming that once something is planned, it will surely happen. James gets right to the crux of the situation in verse 14. Why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. We don't know what the future holds because God has not revealed it to us. Yes, he's revealed our ultimate future to us as Christians so that we have hope, but we don't know our immediate future. And James says we also need to consider our view of ourselves. As we plan out our lives, carefully shaping work, home and social life, we run into a further danger of thinking that we are at the centre of it all. James reminds us, though, that our lives are fleeting. We're here for a little while, and then we're gone. We plan as though everything we do is hugely significant, yet future generations of our families may barely remember our names. James offers a different perspective on these views of ourselves and our future in verse 15. We should be saying, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. Doing this faithfully isn't just a matter of tagging the words, God willing, onto the end of our plans, then carrying on as before. <laughs> when we plan, we should acknowledge that God is sovereign in our lives. We should remember that we're not in ultimate control and that all we plan is subject to the will of God. Everything we do is in his hands. And how we plan is important too. If we know God, we should know the good we should be doing because God has shown it to us. To fail to commit to that, to not do so, is sin. James says in verse 17. We should not be able to say that our diaries are too full for the good we ought to do. Whether that's meeting together as God's people at church, spending time in prayer and Bible study, or serving the people God has placed around us. If we omit these things, we've chosen to make something else our priority. We've not reflected on God's will. We're not to stop making plans, but we do need to recognise the will of God and allow it to shape our plans, our priorities and our lives.
Finally, let's look at what James says about the dealings of the extremely wealthy. This is in the first six verses of chapter 5. He says, Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You've hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You've lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You've fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You've condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. What a complete change of tongue from James here. He's no longer addressing brothers and sisters or fellow believers, but you rich people. The people he addresses are unlikely to ever read his letter, so why address them? James wants to show his readers what God will say to the rich who are giving them such a hard time. As with the prophecies of Isaiah pronouncing doom on pagan nations, God's people needed to know what God thinks of those who are opposed to him. James wants his readers to know how to think about the rich people around them. It would be easy to envy them their wealth or to aspire to be like them. But the extremely wealthy are in a dangerous position, not because of their wealth in itself, but because of what they do and do not do with that wealth. He identifies three issues, hoarding, extravagance, and injustice. Hoarding money and possessions is wasteful. Here, wealth is not used, merely possessed. Extravagance places self at the centre, whereas under God's law, wealth should be used in the service of others. And finally, injustice occurs when the wealthy overlook their duty and responsibility to their workers. Affluence can lead to carelessness, insensitivity and cruelty. Wealth is dangerous because people grow to love not just the money, but also the power and status that money gives them. James includes this passage not only to reassure his readers that God will right the wrongs committed by the rich, but also to remind of the dangers of the love of money. Some more practical advice today from James. Whether we're considering our dealings with others, or the way we plan our lives, or the way we think about wealth, we're to remember that we are not in control. If God is not sovereign in our lives, then we place ourselves at the centre rather than him, and run the risk of rejecting him. We need to reflect on God's will for us, and of our lives, and shape our lives accordingly, prioritising what he prioritises, and allowing ourselves to be guided by him in all that we do. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Father, we thank you for James and his openness to your teaching. Thank you that you showed him the way to godly living. We're sorry for the times we try to take control and get things so wrong. For the times we speak against others, putting ourselves above you. When we plan without considering your will. Or when we covet the wealth of others, not remembering the dangers of a love of money. Help us to keep you at the centre of our lives, that we may always acknowledge your sovereign rule over us. That we may reflect on and be obedient to your will for us. And not place possession of or desire for wealth above our love for you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.